I'm Chris Bergwald. This is, just to make sure you know, uh, make sure you're in the right spot. I should turn around in case you want to leave, but it's the working genius. Uh, <laughs> I, he's not leaving. I thought he was, as soon as I said working genius, tur turned around and I'm out of here. Um, so we're going to be talking about the working genius model today. Uh, but let's begin as soon as Shane has a seat there. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate that. With a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, teach us to pray. Good and gracious God, we give thanks and praise for the gift of this day, for the gift of this conference, for the work that you have called us to do in your vineyard. Father, we pray that you would continue to open our minds and our hearts to the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. That we'd recognize the ways that you call us to put those gifts to work for your glory and the building of your kingdom. We ask you that you would bless us throughout the week of this conference and as we return home. Give us the joy and the zeal the heart out of, an, of an evangelist. We ask this as we ask all things, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So what I was, I, I was doing all the talking with Sister, to be fair, it wasn't her at all, it was all me. What I was telling her, um, we're here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, which is my alma mater for my undergrad, but after I graduated from, from Steubenville, um, so I, I try to be ecumenical. Uh, I went to Steubenville, St Franciscan, and then I went to the Angelicum, which is run by the Dominicans in Rome. So uh, Franciscans, then the Dominicans. I'm, 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 I haven't studied any of their graduate degrees yet, but maybe we'll see. But today is the 700th anniversary of the canonization of St. Thomas Aquinas. So for those who are inclined towards the Dominicans or St. Thomas in a particular way, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, day to celebrate him, in addition to um, St. Camillus de Lellis, who gets probably a little bit forgotten by some of us who are excited about St. Thomas. But that's not what this workshop is about at all. Uh, we're going to be talking about the working genius. So you should all have received, uh, I think Peter, Peter, right? It's Peter? Uh, he's got that hand out in the back. I think you should all have it. Okay, great. So that just gives you a sense of where we're going to be going. Um, I shared this morning in the, the first workshop session for the DASA officials track. Normally, the DASA officials track is really conversational. Um, normally, we just try to take advantage of the, the wisdom and experience in the room, and we'll still do that throughout the track. But because this is a model that's a little bit newer, there's going to be a little bit more teaching or presenting on my part, along with conversation. So what I want to do before we get too deep in, I just get a sense, has anybody, before you came, how many of you had heard of, just heard of, the working genius model? Okay, a, a, a decent number. So I'll get, what I'm gonna do today is give an overview of what the working genius model is, walk through a little bit, and then talk, excuse me, talk a little bit about how here in the Diocese of Sioux Falls where I'm at, uh, how we're using this model to deepen the way that we as a department, the Department of Discipleship and Evangelization, collaborate, but also the way that our parishes in a pastorate model that we've just moved towards, um, we're encouraging them to use it as well. I'm also going to be uh, inviting, so how many of you, besides Baltimore, uh, are using the working genius Oh, oh, that's right, Ontario. Yeah, yeah, the Canadians. By the way, thanks for the smoke. Appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, you guys, sir. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, so I'm going to invite some other dioceses uh, to talk about their experience a little bit. There is, there, we have found the, the working genius model to be really effective in getting work done. Um, Pat Lenchoni is not paying me anything. I'm not getting a kickback or commission. Uh, we've just become really passionate about this, mo passionate about this model um, in not only a diocesan office setting, but also in a parish pastorate context as a way to think through collaboration and productivity in the work of discipleship and evangelization. So uh, the reason why I, I, I when we were talking about this track for this year, so over a year ago, I think, 
uh, I, I, we've been really excited about this model and I wanted to share it with anybody. So you might not be working at Assa's ministry, you might be some other role um, in a school or a parish, totally fine. I think this, it, I know this model can work anywhere. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna walk through, um, as your handout indicates, just gonna walk through just introduction, the different six types of the genius, talking on, on the back of your handout about the difference between a working genius, competency, frustration, the three phases of work, and then those last few points uh, we should be able to get to as well. Um, but by way of introduction, what I wanna say just by way of introduction, um, in Sioux Falls, and we're not unique this way, but the way that we think about formation, uh, discipleship formation, catechesis, however you want to describe it, um, we use the lens of the four areas of formation that originally were applied to priestly formation. So back in 1991, two, J J John Paul II, JP II, wrote a post synodal apostolic exhortation called Pastores Dabo Vobis. And he there, again, it's a post synodal, this came from the, the work of a synod on priestly formation, seminarian formation. Uh, JP2 identified four areas of formation for future priests, spiritual, intellectual, human, and pastoral. We, a number of years ago in Sioux Falls, took that model and applied it just to formation in general for everybody, uh, with one little tweak at the end instead of pastoral, apostolic. So we, th we talk about catechesis through the lens of those four areas of formation, spiritual, how to pray, intellectual, what does the church teach, uh, doctrinal content, human formation, which I'll come back to in a minute, and then apostolic formation. So how we are all, by virtue of our baptism, called to be missionary disciples. So we, we look at um, catechesis in, from that particular lens, that model or that paradigm. The third one, human formation. Um, so for me, this was probably 12-ish years ago, just thinking through um, more about how we do for, we're doing formation um, with, through the lens of these four areas. Um, and spiritual, intellectual, were, and, and apostolic were really clear to me, but human formation was the, the, a bit more, for me, vague and nebulous. So um, one of our priests who now is my boss, Father Scott Trainer, uh, Father Trainer has been a seminary rector in Denver at St. John Vianney Seminary. Before that, he was a formator for them. Um, he's nationally known for spiritual direction and just priestly formation in general. Um, and I, so I knew that Father Scott had really a good grasp of priestly formation. So I wanted to pick his brain to understand more what human formation was about. Um, and I, so Father Scott, what is human formation? And I, I still remember, this is again like 10, 12 years ago, he said human formation is about not being weird. So human formation is about not being weird. Human formation is, so uh, the way that it's described in the context of seminary formation, but it, I think it applies to all of us, um, is my humanity a bridge for other people to Christ, or is it an obstacle? We all have our quirks. Um, we're, we're here in Steubenville. Uh, my wife is from Ohio. Um, my sister-in-law lives here. Her husband, uh, she, she teaches at Catholic Central in Steubenville. Her husband works for the university, so I've known them for almost 30 years. And years ago, Martina said to me, Chris, you're weird. Like, Martina, I'm not weird. Now, she, she meant in a loving way, but I do have quirks. I've definitely, Jermaine, my wife will tell you, I'm weird in that sense. But I'm not so weird that I tend to be, I don't think, an obstacle for other people to encounter Christ. My humanity, my just Christness, uh, is it an obstacle or is it a bridge for other people to encounter or to, to more deeply encounter Jesus Christ? So in the context of seminary formation, so Father's here, he could give us all sorts of details, but you know, it's, it's, as, it's as simple as, so I've got a teenage son. Carl, is, he's got a twin sister. Carl's um, one, uh, the, the only boy, he's got four sisters, his twin sister and three others. So Carl is blessed among women. Um, and we have to tell Car Carl, you need to shave. 
You need to shave. Carl, have you brushed your teeth? Carl, you know, just the things that teenage boys, when it comes to just basic hygiene, we males don't think about usually at that age. We're a little oblivious, and because of that, our humanity can be an obstacle for others to encounter more deeply Jesus Christ. So for us, though, as more mature people, though, human formation is about not being weird. Um, human formation, so okay, I pressed Father Scott on this. Okay, can you say a little bit more about that? Okay. So human formation is about my self-awareness, or self, yeah, self-awareness, self-knowledge, which leads to self-possession, which leads to self-gift. So we are all called to grow in knowledge of ourself, which allows us to grow in possession of ourself, to own ourself, which then allows us to give ourselves away. I can't fully give myself away. I can't give away what I don't possess. So if I want to, the law of the gift, law of the gift. I want to, if I want to give myself to others in love, I have to possess myself. In order to possess myself, I have to know myself. I have to be self-aware. So human formation, besides not being weird, being not weird, is also about growing in self-knowledge or awareness, self-possession, so that I can make an authentic gift of myself to God and to others. One really important point um, for you, but especially, I mean, you're here at the St. John Bosco Conference, um, so I'll just put it this way. It's important that we know ourselves, that we see ourselves the way that Christ sees us. Um, if I just look in the spiritual mirror, so to speak, what am I going to, what, what do we see when we look in the mirror? What, what are, for most of us, what are our eyes drawn to? The flaws, the warts, maybe the weight. We go to the flaws. And that's part of who we are. But they have to be seen in the context of what is my primary identity. Beloved son or daughter of the Father. You may have heard of the acronym RIM, R-I-M, Relationship, Identity, Mission. It's in the context of my relationship with God that I discover my authentic identity. And it's in the context of that identity that I discover what I'm called to do. The ordering is really important. It's out of the relationship with God that I find my identity. And it's out of my identity that I find my mission. As Americans, we're inclined to focus on the doing rather than the being. We've heard that many times. RIM addresses that. Mission is the final thing. It comes out of identity, which comes out of the relationship. What does this have to do with working genius? Well, the working genius model is one of many different kind of assessments out, that are out there that help us to grow in self-knowledge, self-awareness. Um, it's one that's particularly suited to collaboration with others. Uh, in our diocese, we, we've used and we've encouraged the use of Myers-Briggs type indicator, uh, Clifton Strengths. My father Scott and I have both just last December we went through the the week long Clifton Strengths coaching training. Um, there are all sorts of great, great uh, assessments, inventories that are out there. Um, this is one of them, but I ha we found I found that it does come at things from a way that's kind of unique, where it really is about your working genius. Uh, the way that you work, so the way that you collaborate with others. Um, and, and, and Len Shoney, uh, I'll, I'll get to the, the backstory of the model in a minute, but he's really clear. This is not just work in the context of my day job. This is just getting stuff done. So the, 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 the insights from the working genius model can be also be applied in the context of a family. Um, there, there's a, so there's a book the Six Types of Working Genius. There's also a podcast, um, the Working Genius Podcast. And many of those uh, episodes in the, the, begin the early days of the podcast were actually talking about how 
you can apply this in the context of a marriage uh, or family life in general. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, an assessment, a personality inventory, but one specifically geared towards understanding how you work, uh, how you work and therefore how you can work with others. So what are the origins of this? Um, Patrick Lencioni is, is increasingly well known in Catholic uh, circles. He's a co-founder of The Amazing Parish. Um, I, I, I don't know the details of Pat's story. Uh, I know that he was raised Catholic. I think he's been a lifelong Catholic. May have had a, a, a deeper conversion to faith um, at some point, but he's been most well known sort of secularly uh, as an organizational health consultant for Fortune 500 companies. Um, and that was really how uh, he sort of initially came into the Catholic world. He wanted to bring his expertise in helping leadership teams become more healthy and therefore more fruitful into the context of the church space, into the context of ministry in the Catholic church. Um, so, so the amazing parish, but then just his work in general, um, the five behaviors of healthy team, um, he's got different books, uh, the Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Death by Meeting, uh, just really excellent books. The Advantage is a book that sort of summarizes all of that, but that predates this particular model. So this is only about three years ago. Uh, Lencioni and his team stumbled, if you will, on this model because Pat, at, at his, his, his uh, corporate consulting firm, The Table Group, um, people he loves and he, he loved the work they do, but he found himself going back and forth between uh, filled with joy and being exasperated and frustrated. Uh, and one of his colleagues, they asked him, like, Pat, what's the deal? And, and actually he says, and he talks about this in the book, um, that led to a four hour meeting that was the origin of this model, uh, the working genius model. And what he and his team found, and it was verified, it's been verified by thousands of people who have done the assessment, uh, what, they, what, what they originally found, and what's been borne out by trial and error and results, is that all of us are drawn to particular aspects of how work gets done. All of us are drawn to different phases of projects. As, and so, it, so we're drawn to some of them. Others are like, well, we can do it, but we don't love it. And others just drain us. We can do it, but it drains us. So that gets us to the six types. So I just want to walk through the, the six types of working genius on the front of your page. So you can see there, um, by the way, uh, and you may, some of you already know this, but if you look at the first letter of each of the geniuses, the acronym is widget. And Pat says they didn't do that on purpose. The only, I think, enablement, I think, is the only, um, when, they, when they were trying to name that fifth genius, um, they saw it was W-I-D-G blank T. And, and enablement worked for them. Enablement, and I'll talk about this in more detail when we get there, but just to name it now, it kind of gets a bad name because when you think of enabling, you don't want to be an enabler. It doesn't mean that in this context. Just like discernment uh, means one thing in the Catholic world and something else in the working genius model. So there's a little bit of clarification that needs to happen. Um, but Widget, he, he says, we, we did not set out to map to create a, a cute acronym. It really just did sort of unfold. So um, when you're thinking of what are the steps? W-I-D-G-E-T are the six steps of, of, a, of any work that has to get done. So wonder invention, discernment, galvanizing, enablement, and tenacity. What I'm gonna do is just briefly, um, just drawing from Pat's own work, um, walk through each of these types, uh, and then we'll get into the, to the rest of the outline. Uh, but again, this is about the way projects get done. Okay, so any project starts with somebody wondering, wait, could we do this differently? Or why do we do it this way? Is there maybe a better way to do that? The person with a genius of wonder is the one who poses the question. So here's, here's uh, how Pat um, explains this genius. The genius of wonder involves the ability to ponder and speculate and question the state of things, asking the questions that provoke answers and action. 
People with this genius are naturally inclined to do these things. They find it easy to lose themselves in observing the world around them and wondering whether things shouldn't be different or whether there is untapped potential that should be tapped. So wonder is asking my favorite question. It's been my favorite question since my temporary version, since before I got to Steubenville, before going back 30 years. The question that all little children ask before they get jaded and cynical, why? Why, why do we do it this way? Many of us, the people who don't have, well, you're just trucking along, we do things, but it's typically a person who has the genius of wonder who sort of will, <laughs> for some of us who are just used to doing things a certain way, throw a wrench into things. Like, why do we do it so well? Just because that's what we do. Okay, but isn't there a better way? I don't know, no, no, shut up, I, I got stuff to do. Wonder, the person with the genius of wonder asks the question, um, and they're wondering, could it be done differently? So this is my second genius. So that I, I am a why person. I wonder, could we do it differently? But I'm not, going to get to the next one here, I'm not somebody with a genius of invention. Invention as well, it's, it's, the, it's the person who has all the ideas on how to answer the question. I don't have, in fact, that's one of my frustrations. I'll explain what that means in a minute. The point I'm trying to emphasize here is I am just the person who might ask why, even though I have no clue how to answer that question. I'm just the one who like, okay, why do we do it this way? Or isn't there maybe a better way to do it? Um, it's, no pun intended here, it's kind of a frustration for me that I don't have an answer to my own question but that's the gift of collaboration. And frankly, for me, this is where this model, it's just so beautifully blends with, the, with, with Catholic ecclesiology, where the body of Christ, right, where, where the different members of the body play different roles. Uh, and and this, this model just well, coincidentally corresponds to the reality of human nature and human community. To some have been given the gift of to others have been given the gift of. So I, one of my gifts is to ask why, or could it be done differently? But I don't have the gift of coming up with the answer to that question. So, invention. The genius of invention is all about coming up with new ideas and solutions. People with this genius are drawn towards origination, creativity, and ingenuity in the truest sense of those words, even with little direction or context. Though every type is a genius, these are the people who are most often referred to as geniuses because many of their ideas seem to come out of thin air. So this is the person who can just brainstorm and loves to brainstorm all day. Uh, I, I had a, 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 a former coworker, worked with him for many years, and he would say, I've got a hundred ideas and, how, and I, I would get annoyed, really? A hundred, I, I would start to mock him a little bit. We were good friends, so I could mock him and tease him. Like, I suppose you got a hundred one ideas for this too, huh? He, but he did. He was just naturally wired. Um, he wouldn't necessarily, he, he didn't have the, the genius of wonder, but as it did take much just to get him going with all sorts of different ideas. And he would say, as most, the vast majority of people who have this genius recognize, most of the idea, these ideas are lousy. They won't work. But they just, it's really easy for them to come with ideas. These people are, they, they, they're definitely gifts in brainstorming uh, meetings where you're come, trying to come up with solutions. One of our parishes in our diocese, uh, their staff, we, we've done some training with them on working genius, and they don't have anybody with the genius of invention. And it's really hard for them because they, they're a really gifted staff, but they just struggle with coming up with solutions to problems that they've recognized. Uh, they've got all the other geniuses, but not invention. Um, and that's, that's on, on the back, genius gaps and how do you fill them. Um, but this can be a reality that sometimes uh, somebody, you, you're missing an inventor, and so you're like, well, can we do it differently? Well, maybe, but I don't know how. It's kind of the, the collective response. But somebody who has the gift of invention has, they, they thrive, they find joy in just brainstorming and coming up with ideas. But they're all, most of them are not really 
optimal solutions. And that's why D is so important, discernment. Again, before I give you the definition, just to, to be clear, this is not discernment in the, in the way that we think about in terms of Catholic spiritual theology. You know, discerning what to do, Ignatian rules of discernment, or discerning your vocation. Um, there's obviously a similarity, it's the same word, but it's got a much more basic everyday meaning in the context of the working genius model. The genius of discernment is related to instinct, intuition, and uncanny judgment. People with this genius have a natural ability to assess an idea or situation, even without a lot of data or expertise. Using pattern recognition and gut feel, they're able to provide valuable advice and feedback around most subjects in a way that transcends their levels of specific knowledge or information. So my boss, Father Scott Trainer, who helpfully taught me that human formation is about being not, not being weird, uh, Father Scott has discernment. He can pretty, again, without being necessarily an expert or having expertise level of knowledge, and give, he can pretty quickly, he has a gut sense of what the right path forward is. Um, of all the possible solutions, which one is the best for us in this circumstance right now? Father Scott has the gift of discernment. Uh, he, more often than not, can easily identify the right path forward. Um, what, what is, of all these 101 ideas um, that somebody else might come up with, which is the right one to go forward? That's what the role of discernment is. That then leads us to galvanizing. So once the I, so somebody says, okay, why do we do it this way? Or could we do it differently? Yeah, I've got a bunch of ideas. All right, this is the right idea. Now you need somebody who can galvanize. Now you need somebody uh, who can rally the troops behind this idea. So this is how Lynchoni explains galvanizing. Galvanizing is about rallying, motivating, and provoking people to take action around an idea. Uh, people with this genius are naturally inclined to inspire and enlist others to get involved in an endeavor. They don't mind persuading people to rethink or change their plans in order to embark on something worthwhile. This is me. This is by far my top genius. Uh, wonders number two, galvanizing is number one. And when I took the assessment and came to understand the model, yes, absolutely, that's me. Um, invention and discernment, I, I mentioned those uh, for me personally. Those are two, my, but they're both um, frustrations for me. I get frustrated uh, pretty quickly. I've gotten better. I used to get frustrated really quickly when we would just sit around and brainstorm and brainstorm and brainstorm. I have no idea talking, no problem talking about ideas. I've got a doctrine in theology. But I want us to act. I want us, let, let's get it done. Um, so once the idea has been, I may, not have, I may have asked the question, but I didn't come up with the idea any of the ideas, possible ideas. I didn't figure out what the best idea was for us. But once we did, I'm the one who, hey, everybody, let's go. So our Dawson staff in Sioux Falls, we're not real big. There's about 50 of us. I'm the party planner. I'm the one who organizes the Christmas party. I'm the one who rocks around the building to, for staff morning prayer in the morning, literally ringing a bell, call to prayer. Um, I'm the one who, hey, let's, everybody, let's go, whether it's, as mundane or simple as a uh, Christmas after party to rallying behind a bishop's vision, lifelong Catholic missionary discipleship through God's love. So a galvanizer is the one, once the, I, the idea has been chosen that we're going to move ahead with to answer the question initially posed, they're the one who rally the troops. They may not have had the idea, this is me, they might have not have decided the idea, also me, but they get behind the, they don't just get behind the idea themselves, they, again, that word rally others around the idea, okay? And it's people with the genius of enablement who respond to the galvanizer. So enablement in this sense is saying yes to the idea that's been chosen and yes to the galvanizer. Okay, so, um, 
The genius of enablement involves providing people with support and assistance in the way that it's needed. People with this genius are adept at responding to the needs of others without conditions or restrictions. They are naturally inclined to help others accomplish their goals and often can anticipate what, what people might need before they even ask. Individuals that the genius of enablement are frequently unaware that this is a genius at all. So the, these are the people who just say, I'm in. I'm in, I'm willing to help out with this. They don't need to be convinced, they don't need to be cajoled, they're in. But the acronym is to, it's not widget, it's widget. So you can have the idea and people have been galvanized, and they're responding, but somebody needs to get the project across the goal line. And that's what tenacity is all about. Um, it's, it's in the word. The genius of tenacity is about the satisfaction of pushing things across the finish line to completion. People with this genius are not only capable of, but naturally inclined to finish projects and ensure that they are completed according to specification. They gain energy by pushing through obstacles and seeing the impact of their work, and they find joy in crossing tasks off their list and getting closure, getting things done. Um, one of our team members, one of our colleagues, is like, so I, I'm kind of in our, in our building, I'm the poster child for galvanizing. Grace is the poster child for tenacity. Because great, that, that thing about crossing things off the list, she just, leave me alone, don't bug me. She's very pleasant, she's very nice, she's very kind. But she just likes to focus and get stuff done. She's great with people, so it's not like she's rude or anything like that. But she thrives, she gets joy out of crossing things off the list. She gets frustrated when we start all sorts of things and never finish any of them. Many of us do. Um, but, but those who have this genius in particular, this is, this is where they find their joy. And that gets us to um, the whole idea of genius versus composite versus frustration. So the way that, the, one of the metaphors that Lencioni uses to explain this is like the idea of taking um, a thermos like this if something is your genius, you can do it all day long. Just like a hot drink or a cold drink will stay hot or cold in a thermos, if you do something that's your genius, it brings you joy and you can do it till the cows come home. Um, it, it, it gives you life and it's easy for you to do that. I love galvanizing. I love getting people on board. I'm convinced that given enough time, and if you're open enough, I'll get you on board. I like to argue too, that's another story. Um, so uh, so when, when somebody has their genius, with, with whatever their genius is, just like coffee in a thermos stays hot all day, you can do your genius all day. Competency is more like just a styrofoam cup. It'll keep it warm, but eventually it's going to cool, cool off. So my competencies are tenacity and then enablement. I like crossing things off lists. I like getting things done. I can do that with, with relative ease. It doesn't bring me joy the way that galvanizing or wondering can, but I can do that. And, and I can get on board with decisions that are made even with, if it's not the way that I do that. That's not too hard for me, but it doesn't give me life and bring joy the way that, for me, galvanizing and uh, wonderment can. Frustration, take the styrofoam cup and poke a little hole in the bottom of it. I can do those things. I can invent and I can discern. I can do them. This model, to be really clear, Lencioni's really clear, our experience very clear. This is not an excuse to avoid your frustrations. I can, and sometimes just my role in our office, I need to brainstorm. I need to help discern what the right idea is. But, I, but, but it drains me. So uh, sort of example of this, Father Scott Trainer, our boss, a vicar for laying clergy formation for our diocese. Father Scott can galvanize, but it's a frustration for him. So he can lead, we have, uh, this is another Lynchoni thing, we have quarterly strategic meetings. He leads those meetings. Uh, he leads them really well. He leads them well, and by five o'clock, he's exhausted. Um, I can lead a meeting really well, and by five o'clock, I'm ready for the proverbial after party. Um, so, so 
just because it's my, your frustration doesn't mean that you can't do it. Doesn't mean you, you can do it well. Not only are you able to do it, you can do it well. So that idea, you can learn how to do it, but it will drain you. So this is where one practical application of the model comes in. Um, knowing this, so I, knowing about myself, using th this language, knowing that uh, invention and discernment are frustrations of mine has actually been helpful in meetings because I could, I, I, I could recognize in the past, and I can still feel it now, welling up within me the, all right, let's get on with it. Let's just decide. Let's get, so I can help galvanize. I, I have that desire to, my temptation is to short circuit, to cut short the brainstorming process of getting stuff done. I know that about myself now. So it allows me to actually engage in invention discernment until they get to their natural conclusion rather than psh, cutting it off too quickly, okay? So this is one way that we've found this to be really useful is just I, I can stop myself from doing that. The other, thing, the other way it's helpful is, um, well, it, it's, it's another way to restate what I just said. It helps me, in my case, to avoid uh, pulling meetings to my favorite genius. Okay, so um, we talk about this in the Diocese of Zoo Falls, so even though this is being recorded, I'm safe telling you about our bishop. Uh, I feel safe telling you about our bishop. Our bishop, our bishop, bishop Donald DeGrood, his, um, his geniuses are wonder and invention. He loves to ask the questions and come up with ideas. The shadow side of that is, I love you, Bishop. Um, Bishop, we could, a, a decision might be made, and Bishop inadvertently, just because it's his, it's how he's wired, he wants to revisit a decision that's been made. He wants to pull things back by nature. He wants to pull things back to wonder and invention. And for the galvanizer, I'm like, again, I'm, I'm going to exaggerate. Bishop, we already decided that. You can't do that. We've the, the, what's the, the, the water's under the bridge, that whatever, the ship has sailed, Bishop, we've decided. Now, he knows this about himself now. So he, he, he's the same way. He feels that, yeah, but, oh, nope, okay, that's right, we decided. I'm on board. Um, it, it's helpful at just that individual level. The other way this is helpful um, is by relying on these geniuses in the context of work. So this is kind of skipping down to some of the points below, especially like number five, the geniuses as required activities for any kind of team-based work. Um, use these, you, when, you, when you recognize, when you understand this model, you can lean on people, whatever their role is. Uh, if you're already familiar with Lencioni's approach to organizations and teamwork, um, he advocates in certain contexts a half uh, hats off approach. Um, we are definitely adopting that when it comes to using the, the working genius model to get stuff done. We have administrative assistants who have great discernment. They're in the brainstorming sessions for high level projects because they have a gift with others who also have the same genius for identifying the right course of action. It doesn't matter and that in the hierarchy, they're lower than somebody else. We're using, we're taking advantage of their genius to find the right solution to the problem. Um, so it, leaning on recognizing, uh, this is one of the, like uh, number seven, work conversations, team maps, um, if, if you're, you're a team, whether it be a, a department or a parish team, if they do the assessment, they can see, you can see where the gaps are uh, or where they're not, but, more, but in the context of this point, that you can use people's geniuses at certain phases of the projects to get work done. Okay, so I just wanna back up a little bit and we'll go through and then talk more about how uh, different organizations have used this model. So the three phases of work, ideation, activation, and implementation. Um, it's, it, it, there's three phases of work, each of which get two pairs of the, or two of the working geniuses. Ideation, posing the question, why? Or could we do it differently? And then, oh, here's all the ideas. So in the ideation phase, 
It's about posing the question and coming up with the ideas. Activation, though, discernment and galvanizing. Lynchoni, what they found, most organizations inadvertently skip this step, and that's why they run into problems. So implementation is enablement and tenacity. So what many organizations, um, whether it be in the church world or secular world, what many organizations would do is, could we do it differently? Oh, I've got ideas. I'm on board. What? Hold on. Hold on. Is that the right idea? Is that the right discernment? And then the galvanizer, because I'm on board, the enablement people, the, ena the, the enablers, so to speak, I'm on board, but what about the others? Maybe the people who, it's harder for them to not do it their way. Discernment and galvanizing tend to get skipped over. So recognizing the importance of that activation stage or phase, um, they found and we found is really important. Let's think through, let's discern what is the best idea. And then let's get everybody on board. Not just those who are, who are ready to go, who will say yes, let's get everybody on board. Also in Lencioni's world, the idea of healthy ideological conflict comes into play here. So let's hash it out. No, don't hold back, hats off. What do you think? Speak your mind. So you go through that, and that's where that discernment and then galvanizing can come in. Okay, um, so those are the three phases of work and activation being one that's oftentimes missed. Number five, there are required activities for any team-based kind of work. I've already touched on that. Number six, genius gaps and filling them. So you, you, you might take, your team might take the assessment, your department or whatever it is, might take the assessment and you find, oh, as one of our parishes found, we don't have anybody with the genius of invention. Um, there are different ways to address that, uh, especially in the context of the, the church world. Um, what we found and others have found to be helpful. So first of all, was there anybody who has the competency, in this case, of invention? So it, it, genius is great because with genius comes the joy. No joy, no genius, or no genius, no joy. But if somebody has the competency, it may not, be, it may not fill them up but they can do it without too much effort. So in, this, in the case of this particular parish, we looked at their team results, their team map. Okay, does anybody have invention as a competency? And there was somebody who had the invention as a competency. So we could look to them, uh, the, the, that, that parish leadership team could look to them to help with the brainstorming. Um, the other thing in some organizations that will be done is actually enlisting help from other departments. Parish context that, that'd be a little, unless it's a huge parish staff uh, where you're talking about just a department. Um, but in the context of, of a diocese, uh, this is not the case in our team, but if we, theoretically, if we lacked invention, we could, as needed, call on a colleague from another department to help, who, who knows our work and that sort of thing. And then of course, ideally, you hire with invention in mind. Uh, Lenchoni does not say give the inventory as part of the hiring process, but you can interview to get at. And we, we have, we do that. What, when we've interviewed the last several hires, we've asked questions which have been aimed at getting a sense of what their genius is. So we can um, fill out where maybe we're a little bit down in terms of the geniuses. Okay, um, and then finally, Work conversations and team maps. So I already give the example of brainstorming. Brains, in brainstorming, you want people who have the geniuses of wonder, invention, and also discernment. Decision making, you definitely want discernment and galvanizing. I'm just going through this really quickly. Um, launching a product, you want the galvanizer, enablement, and tenacity. Uh, and then a status review and problem solving, that's where, again, a galvanizer um, can be really helpful along with 
enablement and tenacity as well. So that's just a quick example of how, if you're, if you're depending on the kind of conversation or meeting you're having, you might want to rely on certain geniuses more than others. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm not being paid by Lynn Shoney anything for, uh, to talk about this model. It just, I'm really excited about it, um, and I'm glad to hear that there are others who've been using it even more and longer, uh, which just verifies our early experience of it. So I know I'd be happy to stick around. I'll be happy to stick around and answer questions. Um, I'm guessing others would as well, but because we're at time, we're going to close with a prayer, and we'll be on our way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everybody. God bless. Yeah, workinggenius.com, I think, is the website. But just Google it. You'll find it.